Hi everyone, it's Heather Darnell. Welcome back to my art ministry channel. Thank you for joining me for another video. So recently, or lately rather, I've been trying to really come up with a, a great spring project to do. And I just, I've been drawing a blank. But the funny thing is, the one thing that wouldn't leave my mind was using a specific color in a number of projects. And so I thought, you know what? I think I'm gonna start a mini series. That being to uh, use bright aqua green for the next several paintings. I'm thinking up to about five, maybe six. Six might be a stretch. I tend to get bored really fast. Uh, but anyways, and bright aqua green is really one of my favorite colors. Seafoam green is number one. Bright aqua green, I would say, is number two, probably because they are so close in shades. Uh, so anyways, and since it's spring, I thought, Psh, can't go wrong. You know what I mean? It's really colorful and vibrant. So that said, I'm going to, instead of trying to think of something exactly what I want to do, which is usually my pattern, um, I'm going to just change it up. I'm going to um, just kind of build my abstract skills and my creativity level using palette knives, pouring, brush stroke. I mean, whatever I can get my hands on as long as I incorporate bright aqua green as the main color. So for today, what I had in mind doing was using the color orange to pair with the bright aqua green. Now, it's gonna be really interesting because I'm not really a fan of orange. I, lo I love it. It really depends on what I see it with, you know, um, and it does remind me of summertime. It's really refreshing. Um, I happen to love the fruit. <laughs> and so, but I, trying to pair it with something is not really easy, but it is another vibrant color. Looks kind of fun together. And so let's try it out. But anyway, if you missed the last two or three videos of mine, the, the big news that you missed is the reason why I'm standing in a complete different space, you know, which might be leaving you asking yourself, what, what the heck happened to all of her stuff, you know? Yeah, I still have it. It's just, I don't have my own space for the time being. Technically, we do still have a three bedroom. We moved to a three bedroom and we were anticipating me using that space, but given the complexity of my husband's training course, we're like, you know what? No, um, it's gonna be better that he uses that room, leaving me kind of just you know, to be creative in the situation. So I don't want to go on about it, but um, that is also why I will not be able to deliver my ministry snack on camera. Rather, I'm going to take you outside with me just because the timing that I even have to, you know, that I have to just record even this little bit is really, really limited. I'm trying to minimize the noise and the distraction and all that stuff. So in October, when we leave yet again, uh, hopefully, things will be in a better um, position for, you know, both of us, you know, my husband and myself, so we can, you know, get along just fine. Not like we don't get along, but I mean, our needs and wants are both met. But thank you for letting me spend the last minute or so, you know, repeating myself. It's not something I like to do. But again, this little bit of the message is to just make sure that everybody's on the same page. So I think this is the last time I'll bring that to the table. But I also forgot to tell you last message as well, we also live right next to a naval air station. And so there are a lot of low flying military aircraft. And sometimes that can be disruptive. And it's, I actually don't mind um, two reasons. I am an aviation nerd. So that's kind of like, you know, music to my ears. And the other thing is that's the sound of freedom. So again, it's a win-win for me. But I do want to apologize in advance because my microphone doesn't filter everything out. But before we get started, today's ministry snack comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And it reads, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
All right, guys, let's dive into this. And I hope you're enjoying the view so far, too. Okay, so John was one of the 12 disciples or apostles who gives us his accounts of Jesus's life and ministry while on earth, according to the Gospel of John, which, of course, the Gospels are what begins the New Testament within the Bible. And as usual, I just want to reiterate to you all that my messages are given to you with the best of my current knowledge and understanding regarding the given text. Now, as I said before, and I'll say it again, you'll notice that my pattern has been that any scripture I share with you has some foreground to it that, of course, leads up to what is given to you so that you're not left with a blank look on your face that leads to being disconnected. And we can't have that, or I should say, I don't want that. So at this time, Jesus was celebrating the Passover meal with his BFFs, which was celebrated once a year. Real quick, I know there are a lot of people who have heard of the Passover, but have no clue what it means and or why it's so significant. So I'm just going to briefly touch on that before I get into the meat and potatoes. After all, it is mentioned in the scripture just before the given text, so I may as well bring it into light. Now, the Passover was basically the final and most severe plague that God brought upon the Pharaoh of Egypt, who at the time refused to let his people go freely. As harsh as the other nine plagues were, Pharaoh's heart was so stubborn and prideful that the suffering of his own people from those plagues didn't phase him because he was that caught up on standing his ground. So one night, God said to Moses to tell the people that whoever doesn't have lamb's blood painted around their doorposts on the night specified, the Lord will pass over the land of Egypt and smite the firstborn of every household as an instantly take their lives. After such mass death along the land of Egypt is what finally and temporarily got the Pharaoh's attention to wake up and actually let the Israelites go. Now, if I elaborate more on why there's lamb's blood or the fact that the Pharaoh only had a temporary awakening, I'd be steering away from this message. But anyway, that event is what leads up to the parting of the Red Sea and all that. This whole thing is basically when God delivered his people and commanded that event, being the Passover, to be remembered annually and in celebration so that his people will never forget the love, capability, and protection of God. So here we have Jesus celebrating with his close friends just as commanded. By the way, you don't have to pull my arm to get me to have a good time. Just think God commands his people to celebrate, and often too, to feast, but more importantly to remember why or the significance of celebrating and feasting. So anyone who thinks God is dull and boring needs to look into the text a little more here because he is far from boring in that regard. So this particular feast just so happens to be, unfortunately, the last meal Jesus was going to have with his disciples and towards the end of the celebration, he saves the bad news for last as in a reminder of it being his last time feasting with all of them. He's telling them with a heavy heart that he's only going to be with them a little more while as in only be around for another day before all hell breaks loose, so to speak, at least for the disciples and all who loved and followed Jesus. He continues to explain that they cannot go where he is going, but in the meantime, to follow the new commandment he has been continuously showing his disciples, which is to love one another the way he loves them. Meaning not just within their little clique, but to everyone. For Jesus loves the world, not just part of the world or a select group of people. This same feast, of course, is also when Jesus washed his disciples' feet as a physical example that titles and statuses don't matter. You serve one another with love. Jesus is king of kings here, and he stooped down washing stanky feet, doing the job of a low life, yet disregards his title and deity status just to prove his point. So let that sit with you. Anyway, so now this dinner party is going sour. Not only did Jesus reveal that someone in their clique is going to betray him, which will ultimately have him crucified, but now he's not going to be around anymore. They don't really understand that Jesus is going to die, although he's put it on the table before time and time again for them to chew on. But none of them have really picked it up to truly consider that fact. And so here's another demonstration of them not processing that information yet again, that he's going to die. Instead, they were stuck on the fact that Jesus isn't going to be around anymore. Seriously, he just put it out there like five minutes ago that the hour has come, that it is time for him to be glorified and that God is to be glorified in him. So as much as Jesus didn't want to go through all that he knew he was going to go through and leave his BFFs on top of that, he had to press on anyway. He knew what took precedence, which was living out the will of the Father and fulfilling the prophecies. Now, you'd think the meaning of dying would click in one's head, obviously meaning they won't be around anymore. But again, they're not thinking of death for it to mean it like that. They're thinking of him straight up walking away from them, abandoning them, leaving and forsaking them, you know, leaving them high and dry type thing. Though they were all grown men, the last three years spending night and day with Jesus felt like a lifetime to them. And then for him to just cold turkey call it quits doesn't make sense to them. It's just not registering. They're like, dude, 
You mean after all we've been through, you're just going to up and leave like that? And you're not even going to tell us where you're going so we can't follow you there? That's so not cool. You know what wasn't cool? The fact that at the hour of his death, all his disciples abandoned him. So it was actually the other way around. Peter even denied him. How's that for not cool? So listen to this. Even though Jesus knew of his betrayal and that his friends would be like scattering cockroaches under a light at the time of his death, he still partied with them. He still loved them unconditionally. Now, due to his future whereabouts, meaning that he won't be in person with them anymore, this is where I can visualize a lot of rowdiness and commotion going on. You know, everyone's speaking over each other. And if Jesus had a hammer, I can totally see he'd be slamming it down and saying, order, order. Okay, I'll be honest. I'm visualizing myself here. And I say that because when my son gets too rowdy, I tend to clap my hands loudly and say, okay, enough now to drown out his verbal chaos so that I can continue to say what I need to say already. But Jesus actually has a better way of getting them to settle down their verbal chaos and further listen to what he's saying to bring them comfort in the midst of them being in their frantic mode. Now onto the passage breakdown and or remix, starting with verse one, it reads, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. So he tells them just as the text says to let not your hearts be troubled. Now let's pause right there and say that again with me. Let not your hearts be troubled. Well, that's as hard as asking me to love someone as much as Jesus loves me. Jesus knows he asks difficult things of us. Really, he knows. Shoot, he knows being a Christian, period, is difficult. I'll elaborate that on another message, but the point is we are a troubled people. Fear and worry are natural to us, but real quick, that doesn't mean that God gave us fear. Fear is a default of now being flawed and broken due to sin. He did, however, give us a spirit, and that spirit through Christ Jesus has the ability to overcome that fear. Don't forget we have limitations and capacities. We can only do so much before we fail ourselves. That said, we have justified fears, things that warrant our stress and cortisol levels to elevate higher than usual, and he considers that. He knows that. He validates that. Just think Jesus had fears too. I mean, we'll thankfully, by God's mercy and grace, never experience the fear he had as those soldiers marched right up to him to take him away to be tortured and beaten for like six hours, if I remember correctly, and then be crucified. So again, there's that validation that being fearful is not always frowned upon. In retrospect, I keep seeing posts and hearing that the Bible says in some way to not fear. Whether it be, do not be dismayed, fear not, let not your hearts be troubled, don't worry, or anything in that regard, 365 times. That's one statement for every day of the year. Now, I haven't taken the time to confirm that, but it sounds pretty legit so far. I mean, if you read your Bible, you really do see that all over. So rather if it's 365 times or just 142, the point is it's said frequently because we frequently forget to not fear. Fear itself is yet another message for another time, but since Jesus briefly mentions it here, so will I. All he's saying is take our rational fears and bring those to him. Petition your fears to him. He petitioned his fears to the father, asking him to somehow see if it was possible to pass that cup of what was coming in another direction. And so he, there's his example for us. Now I say rational because some things in life, like I said, give us a legit reason to shake us up. Like, OMG, my finances, my last doctor appointment didn't go so well, my friend or family member is not a believer. You know, something along those lines are rational as opposed to irrational. Irrational things are like people who take the fear mongering route and make you believe that if you don't do this or don't do that or don't believe this or don't believe that, then you'll be shamed and ridiculed or be the fault of so many things or simply fearing to live and experience the gift of life that God has given us because there's a, I don't know, one in six million chances of something bad happening in a specific situation, like camping out with wildlife nearby when I find that funny because there's a much greater chance of danger and death driving our cars and most of us do that daily versus occasionally. You guys, this message is for myself too because I also live with a lot of irrational fear in my life. Mostly all the unknowns of living the military life, constantly changing duty stations and all along with a rapidly falling nation. I tend to wrongly meditate on those and unfortunately more often than not at least more recently, have been letting it rob the joy that Jesus constantly makes the effort to deliver to me on a daily basis. But the point is, you're not alone. So after Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled, 
He clearly says to believe in God and to also believe in him. He says that because he also says a few verses down in verse 10, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father that dwells in me does his works. Now check this out. Listen to this. He's hammering home his statement and encouraging them as he continues to say, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So you want to know what God is like and or looks like? Jesus. That's our answer. Now, we don't actually know what he looked like, unlike the people of his time did, but his physical appearance didn't matter. It was his soul, his very nature. That's why the Bible doesn't have any physical descriptions of him other than he was a Jew. It's just so sad that too many people choose not to believe that fact, to look at Jesus as being part of the Holy Trinity, hence why they're still staggering in life, still lacking peace, still lacking faith, still lacking loving and forgiving others, still lacking purpose, all that. The Pharisees were prime examples too. I mean, talk about a great illustration for today's unbelievers because they're really no different. And so Jesus says, either believe in me and you'll experience a whole new level of everything or sit there and believe whatever else you want because whatever else you want or choose doesn't measure up to me, which also so happens to have a cost or a price believing in anything else. And unfortunately, a lot of the world's deception is that there is no cost. There is no consequence. There is no big deal to believe in whatever we want to believe in or whoever we want to believe in. He's also saying, I'm not forcing you, I'm just encouraging you. So the statement of Jesus saying, believe in God, believe also in me, is him being encouraging to his disciples so that they will see the light at the end of the tunnel and that actually they will be together again, but in a totally new way and in a totally new place, as will we. Also, before I forget, highlight those two words, way and place. That said, let's move along to verses two and three, as it says, in my father's house are many rooms, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? As in, if I were just blowing smoke up your butt, why would I tell you otherwise? And he continues to say, And if I prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Other translations say Jesus will receive us to himself, but either way, it's evident that we will indeed be with him again. Also take note of that word, again, because it's very important regarding the second coming and or the rapture that I'll briefly touch on later. As you can see, there's so much to unpack in just a few verses with all these key words. We must also pay attention how some translations specify mansions in the text in place of many rooms. Now, this is a common area in the Bible where many people believe that where it mentions many rooms or mansions, which is obviously a glorified structure that has many rooms, that somehow it's a literal description. While Jesus speaks many things in literal terms, other things he speaks are in limited terms meaning he speaks metaphorically in a way that it can be processed in the mind of a human with limited understanding. Let's face it, the human race has limitations and capacities like I mentioned earlier. If it weren't so, we'd be the competition of God versus a creation of God. So just like Jesus was washing his disciples' feet, although he gave a physical, literal example of serving, he also gave an illustration for our limited minds to understand the context as well as the concept. Here, I believe he's giving us a mental illustration of a couple of things. First of all, I'm under the impression that everyone knows what a mansion is. I just mentioned it. It's an oversized, luxurious house, of course, with many rooms, just shy of what feels like a palace, filled with all sorts of amenities and things that give its overall appearance a major statement in itself. Most of us have seen a few episodes of the old school TV show, MTV Cribs. I don't know if that's still a thing, but anyways, it, it was a show, is was, I don't know. It, it's a show where celebrities would open up their homes for the rest of the world to be in awe and envy over. I, I was one of those people for sure who just who had to check out the latest and greatest. Uh, and we all know a place like that is far better than the average home. Obviously, because it's well above average, it's extraordinary to say the least. Well, Jesus gives us that as a metaphor, not as a suggestion that he's literally preparing an actual mansion in heaven but the fact that heaven itself is extraordinary and worthy to be in awe over and is why I believe he chose that metaphor for us to mentally process in addition to one more thing. But before I move on to that one more thing or that second thing, I think something else that gets our imagination going in the wrong direction when we incorrectly read into the text about there being many mansions is that it somehow also means when we get to heaven that we're gonna be in this pearly gated community 
living in these mansions where we still drive on streets, you know, going down redeemed road, crossing over to glory lane just to get where we want, still doing what we want, just like as if we do here on earth in individual houses with individual lives and families, but just fancier now. Although heaven has many descriptions revealed in the book of Revelation as one example, Again, you're not going to find anything like Jesus' description here, anywhere that could potentially give us the idea that we're surrounded by and living in a man-made environment. This example isn't for him to toy with our minds. Again, he uses a metaphor in this instance to simply get us to understand that there's something better than average, even better than above average, as an example that our minds have the ability to process. Now, let's also talk about many rooms and why actual earthly mansions, to me, don't make sense being in heaven which leads up to that second thing. Now, who knows? God may have many jaw-dropping structures with many rooms that he erected, of course. Shoot, I know he describes heaven having streets of gold, but until I'm there, I just can't imagine anything really other than knowing my mind will be blown and I'll never get tired of it. But getting to the point of why I don't see earthly mansions with many rooms being feasible in heaven is because of the necessity of various rooms that we have here on earth. For instance, we have bedrooms, bathrooms, and kitchens, all essential spaces that collectively make a home in addition to some kind of living space, i.e. A, a den or whatever. Now, what do we need bedrooms for? Sleep goes without saying, of course. Then bathrooms, obviously, to bathe ourselves and relieve ourselves and kitchens to store and prepare our food for our daily nourishment. Well, in heaven, because we will no longer be in our earthly bodies, those earthly rooms or spaces now seem useless. Our heavenly or glorified bodies will not require sleep. We will not need any sort of recouping, recharging, any of that. Our bodies will no longer be at a point where the time of day matters to accommodate what our bodies need according to the time of day, if I'm making sense. Besides, there's no more time of day in heaven anyways. It's timeless. Earth is the only place bound by time. We won't need showers and baths because we won't be sweating due to being nervous or going through menopause, living in hot weather conditions, or doing any kind of hard labor. Shoot, we won't be laboring at all, nor those other things. But the point is we won't be dirty. So that said, there's no point in needing a space to go freshen up and or even wake up. As for food goes in our new bodies, whatever nourishment is provided, I believe it will solely be the word of God. Jesus mentions throughout the Gospels how he was being tempted by the devil to eat bread because he's been fasting for so long already, knowing he's totally starving. But Jesus comes back and says, one cannot eat bread alone, as net doesn't cut it. Bread is a temporary filler, and that's all it does. It temporarily satisfies the belly, not the heart and or the spirit. That is also why in the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us this day our daily bread, as in give us this day our daily scripture, our spiritual food, our spiritual nourishment, so that it is filling like bread and also providing nourishment, but not filling and nourishing the same way as scripture does. Just know the difference there. So again, I don't see food being a requirement for our daily sustenance, that we would still need kitchens and a place to store our K-cups and cliff bars. And because we won't need food the same way Jesus says we won't need food, we won't need a bathroom. And even if we did consume food, our glorified bodies would utilize every speck of nutrition to the point our new bodies wouldn't need intestines and other bodily parts to filter our waste and undigested food because there would also be no processed food either to filter out the ailments. So rather if it's scripture food or actual food or both, we'll still be filled to the brim in an everlasting excellent way, all provided by God himself. Oh, the added joy we will have not sitting through 25 red lights and 11 stop signs just to get to a Sam's Club or Costco or rely on ourselves to obtain anything from anywhere else. That's a win-win if you ask me. So in summary of this part, as we can see the place, which was one of those words I told you earlier to mentally highlight, but we can see the place in which he's prepared is a common area, being heaven, where it is accommodating for all. There's a place or a room, if you will, for all not an actual individual dwelling unit made with hands, and it will be off the charts amazing. The second thing I wanted to bring up is the other word I mentioned earlier to also mentally highlight, which is the word way. But what I wanted to bring up is kind of already what I've been talking about here, which is our glorified bodies and how they're being transformed in a unique way, being that place or space that he prepared for us. So there's where I wanted to bring into light a little more regarding this specific topic. Our earthly bodies are temporary or temporal. It's like a tent. And I say that because a tent is something designed for 
dwelling temporarily in. And after a time of continuous usage, it can take a beating, meaning no longer making it a suitable and or usable place to be in from all of the wear and tear and or just all of the environmental factors decaying it. Also think of it like this. Like I mentioned earlier, we now have fear as a default due to sin, meaning once Adam and Eve chose sin over God that was brought into the world, we were also brought into a curse that isn't just being born of a sinful nature now, but we also have fears and go through an aging process, as in our body and systematic functions decays more by the day, taking that daily beating of all that junk we eat, sleep we deprive ourselves of, being exposed to whatever's in the atmosphere or environment, allergies, illnesses, all that. Whereas before sin, before our bodies downgraded into tents, we were naked and unashamed, fearless, selfless, meant to live out a timeless and flawless life, walking in the full glory and presence of God. So now we basically have to wait until his second appointed time, also known as the rapture, to ditch our tents and take on our new glorified bodies. Now check this out. Listen to this that backs this up, or at least to me is ever so convincing that these dwelling places are more of a reference to our heavenly bodies more than a mansion or any actual structure made by God. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 1 through 5, it reads, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, as in moaning complaint about the aging conditions of our bodies, having bodily restrictions, limitations, being sick, all that stuff, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would further be clothed, as in being clothed in his righteousness, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So I hope you caught on where Paul mentions our bodies being like a tent. Okay, this part is also super important, something that should leave you with heavy considerations if you haven't had them already. So now let's go back to the highlighted text where Jesus says he will come again to take us or to receive us to himself. So throughout the Bible, you will read of many prophecies that tell not just of the forecoming of Jesus, meaning his birth, but also his death and resurrection. Like I mentioned Isaiah being one of them, the last message I gave you. But there are some prophets that also speak of Jesus' second coming, Isaiah also being one as well. Anyway, this is a time where Jesus comes again to take us to himself, which is called the rapture, as I mentioned earlier. This is an event where us believers are spared from the great tribulation and when God pours out his wrath on the earth and all of its inhabitants as judgment and condemnation for all of our sin. And he will take us in a way that is wild to say the least. Like how scripture supposedly says, do not fear 365 times. Scripture also says many times that we will literally be snatched out of thin air where we will meet Jesus to be with him. And here's that key word that he said, in which is again. And the fact that he says he will receive us or take us to himself again means that he is not messing around. The sad truth of the matter is all mankind is basically held captive until we are freed and receive our free gift of salvation. But even then, we still have to live on this difficult earth. So in a sense, we're still held captive to a degree until Jesus is coming. So you can also think of it like this. If someone were holding my son captive or your kid, you'd better believe I'm going to come for him and take him back to myself to be with me once again, just as I'd imagine you would too for your kid. There's nothing stopping this angry mama bear, just like nothing is stopping Jesus, who is done messing around with all this sin on earth. He says, my kids have had enough earthly torment and I'm coming for them. This particular event and hell in general, I believe is discussed more in detail than the details of heaven because hell is a place that wasn't even made for man. And you can check that out in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 41. But hell is so bad that even demons pleaded with Jesus not to send them there when they came into contact with him. And so the grim details of the Great Tribulation, the millennial reign, and hell are all given in such great lengths so that no one is shortchanged in understanding the severity of them. It's simply given to us to wake us up, whereas heaven is talked about here and there sort of as a, a sneak peek and, of course, as some encouragement of a place to look forward to. So I'm just laying it on a little thick here regarding these because the rapture in Jesus' second coming is brought to our attention that they are a very real deal and that only true believers in Jesus will be saved from the unfathomable catastrophe. So if you think today is awful, and I'd agree with you that it is too, but let me tell you, today's issues and dealings are a walk in the park of what's to come. You can read mostly about that coming time in the book of Revelation, Daniel, Thessalonians, Isaiah, and Zechariah, just to name a few. And they are both liberating and frightening at the same time. But it's not meant to be frightening to those who will not be a part of that. Hence, 
why it is absolutely vital to be a true believer in Christ down to the core, laying up our treasures in heaven, which if you're not, I'd seriously consider opening your heart and asking Jesus for forgiveness to receive your free gift of salvation and be spared from that. And when all this happens again, which is another prophecy yet to be fulfilled, no one knows that hour. And Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 36 through 40 and 42 through 44, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, meaning everyone was living it up in evil ways with no regard for the Lord, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Real quick, take note of the word all. As in all who lived, every soul on earth were swept away, except Noah and his family, which the flood in this instance was a form of God's wrath. Only this time, the second coming, even though it will be just as swift and sudden, it won't be in the same manner. Listen up, y'all. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this. That if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So once he's received his bride, which is us, being believers in Christ, also known as the body of Christ, being married to him, we will be with him also. To try to make better sense of this, he is married to the church. He is the bridegroom and we are his bride. He vows to dedicate everything to us like a spouse vows and dedicates their lives to each other. And he also vows to take us to himself at the appointed time and hour that we do not expect. You guys may remember a recent message I did when I did a Gucci-inspired acrylic pour about not storing up earthly treasures. That where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. I think this is a perfect parallel to what Jesus is also trying to say. That if he's truly their treasure, then their heart will be with their treasure in heaven, not perishing with the earth and all that's left in it. Okay, moving on to verses 4 and 5. Jesus continues to say, And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas, another disciple, said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Now, after spending years with Jesus, they have heard so much about the Father in heaven and all that awaits them. Yet they're coming across as stumped here, as if Jesus is going to some other secret location that they know nothing about when really they do. They're just not digging deep enough. And so Jesus replies with a slam dunk in verse 6. Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Talk about a bold statement. I am. He's the only one that can name drop something big like that and actually mean everything as in be totally accurate of what he says he is. And that's not the only place where he says I am. Hopefully you picked up earlier that he said the same statement where he says, I am in the Father. But he also says throughout scripture, I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the salt of the earth. I am living waters and so on that you will find. So all these things are a compilation of what represents Jesus as a whole, as his very nature, so that we get the big picture, so that we are not fooled and not deceived. And it's sad so many people don't consider when he says, I am the way, as in I am the way to heaven. And just as he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's narrowed down quite a bit, and it's narrowed down for a reason. It's not narrowed down to him and like three of his favorite saints or your favorite saints. It's just him, a one-man deal because anyone else was no big deal compared to Jesus. Now, the saints were absolutely fantastic and surely advanced God's kingdom on a number of levels. But they were human as much as the next person, meaning they weren't perfect. They were sinners. They weren't worthy for sacrifice for the world's redemption and salvation like Jesus was. So it makes no sense to put a senseless example as someone we have to get through just to get to Jesus, who also happens to be and in God the Father. He cut all those ropes and says and literally means, I am the way. That's also why he says the gate to heaven is narrow and the gate to destruction, also known as hell, is wide due to people having watered down what is actually implied, because unfortunately they'd rather look into more of what their specific religious and or denomination views and interpretations means, rather than what Jesus just spelled out very clearly. They think not everything requires Jesus' involvement or not really living for Jesus can still get them into heaven. Heaven is basically for Jesus' VIPs. If we truly believe what he just said and truly believe in him, 
then our name is written on his A-list, a.k.a. the Book of Life. That means not just anyone gets in or in any way we see fit. Otherwise, it would no longer be what he created and meant to be holy and sanctified, meaning to be set apart. Now, before we get started, just remember there's a heavenly place custom made awaiting for us, in addition to other amenities that don't measure up to the ones here. So let's not get too comfortable on a perishing earth living in things created by humans. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see and experience actual perfection of everything God has ever made, especially my new glorified body walking with him. All right, guys, let's head back in and get started. I'm starting my project with a 10 by 20 deep panel gallery wrapped canvas using a large spatula to spread out my primary base color of bright aqua green. You'll see for this portion, I'm just squeezing a generous amount of paint onto my canvas. I want some texture in here, so adding a little extra paint in addition to using a palette knife is going to ensure me those results. After I wipe my knife clean, I do the same to the other side using the color Vivid Red Orange. I'm going to work on my sides later off camera, but what I'm going to do is basically give this piece a wraparound look or a continuation look. In other words, what you see here, the composition is going to wrap around the sides or continue onto the sides to keep it clean looking. All right, so now on to the details. I'm gonna use my number 81 square tip narrow palette knife and I'm gonna start with a phthalo green and a tidbit of burnt umber for my contrast colors. Oh, by the way, I use the blow dryer for a few minutes to help dry out my base colors so that when I apply my accent colors here, they won't muddy or blend in as much. I probably should have spent more time using the blow dryer, but you know, oh well, <laughs> let's see how it turns out. Also take note that when I was applying the base colors, I was going more in a horizontal fashion, but now I'm going more in a vertical fashion. And I'm doing this because it will help create more of a rough look with the paint. Now, I'll be honest, I'm not sure of my thoughts about these contrast colors at this point. I mean, I like them, I'm glad they're incorporated, they're great colors, but I don't know if it's too much at this point. So I'm gonna continue on anyways and just, just go with the flow <laughs> or try to. Oh my gosh, pieces like these, just doing whatever is so hard for me. I'm more comfortable knowing exactly what I want to paint. But this is a great lesson to increase my patience as well as my creativity, especially using a palette knife, because these aren't exactly my go-to tools. Okay, so now I'm going to add in some vivid red orange and a little naphthol crimson. I want the orange to give the bright aqua green some balance, and I think the red is a great color to give this piece a little more pop of color too. You'll see I basically try and place the colors on and or near my contrast colors. I'm thinking if I do all my colors separated or more evenly spaced, that it would swallow up the base color and then it would just look too busy. I'm afraid it's already heading in a busy direction, but again, this is where I just need to take it one minute at a time, you know, <laughs> baby steps here. Um, I, I do have to say palette knife painting is so soothing. I, I don't know what it is that it makes it so soothing in a different way versus using a traditional paintbrush, but regardless of what tool I'm using, I am enjoying myself. Painting in general is my decompressor. So either way, this is a win-win. Here I'm adding in the color mint to serve as some highlights throughout 
and to be a little heavier with it along the borderline between my two base colors. I want to bring it out far enough so that when I add in my heavy bodied colors, it will still come through from behind so that my heavy bodied colors don't get easily lost in the bright aqua green section and or my vivid red orange section. Now at this point, again, really, I'm just experimenting with color variation, shadowing, all that. <laughs> Plus, I'm also trying to fix some areas that appear to have muddied. And so I'm going to spend the next few minutes working on that. I'll probably end up covering some of it up with more bright aqua green. The good thing is, though, the more paint I add, the more texture I'm creating with each layer. So the end result should have a decent impasto look to it, which just means having a raised texture. As you can see, I've been adding a lot more base color in to calm down some of the contrast colors. Um, although I keep kind of going back to that one section there that still looks pretty heavy, but like I said, it's a work in progress. But overall, I think by calming these colors down is good because it's also helping to keep this piece stay very vibrant. Okay, so I think I've managed to get my contrast colors under control and have incorporated more accent colors back in, particularly the orange, so that it has some balance. But now I wanna add in some gold as an additional accent color that I think will help really make this piece pop.
Moving on to my orange section, I'm adding some Naples yellow hue to serve as the highlights. And as you can see, I'm pretty generous with it along the borderline there so that it evens out with the mint color. Well, well, I think I went a little overboard there, so I'm going to add in more base color to help calm that down. Now, like the bright aqua green side where I incorporated vivid red orange to give it some balance, I'm doing the same here. I'm adding bright aqua green into the vivid red orange side for an overall balance between the two within the composition. Here it's really hard to see, but I'm adding in an iridescent orange yellow. I thought this would be a great additional accent color, and although you can't see it, you definitely will when the light hits it, again giving more interest and bling, so to speak, within. On to the final details. So now I'm using a small rounded palette knife here and I'm basically incorporating all the colors within the composition along the borderline. This is where I'm also using a high solid gel gloss medium mixed in with my paints for that heavy body texture and I'm randomly placing the colors along the borderline. Although you'll see me trying to keep the contrast colors, even the red towards the back there or behind all the brighter colors. Real quick, this is just eating at me, but I'm going to go in and calm down some of that bright aqua green in there. I think that's making it look too busy. I think it's okay to be more busy on one side, but not both sides. Plus having this multicolored trimming or accent line here, I think it's just killing the piece. All right, I think I'm gonna let these colors dry some so that I can add a few more in later without them getting mushy and blending in. And then I'll bring you down for a close up. Well, here it is completed. And I must say, this is a total surprise. I, I love this. What great fun colors. And I would have never have guessed bright aqua green and orange would pair so well together, especially with all the additional accent colors. And I'm still taken back even that the shadowing and highlights looked great. I mean, a piece like this, you know, that's so vibrant, I wouldn't think would need anything like that, but I'm so glad I incorporated them in. And it was just fun to go to town with a palette knife again and challenging myself with a tool that's more foreign to me. 
Anyway, this is definitely abstract contemporary, so I think I achieved my goal here. And I'd really actually like to repeat this color palette again in the near future. And I hope you like the colors too. But before I sign off as usual, I just wanted to recite the Artist Creed with you. Something to keep in the back of your mind to say before you begin any project yourself, if your intentions are to remain close to God. As it says, I believe my talents are a gift from God, and I am to use them to fulfill His purposes in my life and in His world. I humbly acknowledge and accept my gifts as I ask to receive God's vision for how I am to use them. I ask the Holy Spirit to free me from self-doubt and self-absorption. I pray this work will bring me into closer alignment with God's plan for me as I seek to bring my gifts and talents into His light and to become the whole and complete person He intends me to be. Amen. All right, so that concludes this demo. And if you liked it, please be sure to not only share it, but to also hit like and subscribe for more videos. But more importantly, remember to thank God for this opportunity and to always paint from the soul. See you next time. Bye.